breaking down the four essential pieces in building a combat encounter in Dungeons and Dragons. Time out. I know I just said that hot button term D&D, but this video was filmed before all this OGL stuff, all this crazy Wizard of the Coast stuff. And this video and this encounter builder, luckily, is system agnostic. Because building out encounters and how I'm about to lay out here is applicable towards any game system like Pathfinder 2nd Edition, or even if you're still playing D&D. Or my own TTRPG that I'm launching called the DC20 RPG system. I just did a video about that. That'll be down in the description too. But I just want to give a disclaimer here. In the future, whenever I do make videos, if Dungeons and Dragons pops up, I am going to be making system agnostic content or system that you could use in D&D. Let's go. And we're not just going to check the boxes. We're going to dive all the way in because this is not going to be some sacks of health attacking your party that they get so bored out of their minds they can't wait to get back to their phone. And on top of these four DM tips, if you really want to go next level and have a resource and tool to help you build these encounters, I do have a full resource called a build a battle system that we're going to be getting into as well. Because combat encounters and making them awesome, epic, and memorable, and engaging is a huge part of playing this game. And a lot of players' favorite part of the game is combat, so let's knock it out of the park. Here we go. The first tip for better D&D combat encounters is terrain. Not just any old terrain, I mean dynamic terrain. Think of any of your favorite movie action scenes in any way, it probably had some level of dynamic terrain. Lord of the Rings or 300, enemies being funneled towards a choke point, crazy stuff like swinging from chandeliers or even something as simple as Star Wars is the high ground. Star Wars is? Now a lot of times the type of terrain that you're gonna be in is heavily dependent on the story and where you're at and certain things. It's gotta be in a castle because that's where the combat's happening. It has to be in a swamp because that's where they're going through. So once you know what kind of terrain you're gonna have based on the story of what's going on try and change it how can you change it yes they're in a swamp where is the difficult terrain in the swamp what things are lying underneath the swamp yes it's a castle but what kind of things are going on is it a rickety castle the pieces are falling apart is there a big section where there's a whole bunch of stuff all piled over they have to climb on top of or simple things like a staircase leading up to a higher level and a window that's open now i'm going to share with you guys one of the many resources in this build a battle system that me and my team came up with here's a little table terrain features and alterations i always like to put things like this in a table so if you want to be spicy you can could roll the dice and kind of have it be a little random just challenge your creativity or you can just read through it and pick starting off raising and lower ground level super simple to do second terrestrial hazards acid pools lava poisonous gas pockets three is adding stuff to break up line of sight like big tree trunks or walls four is containers and dressings which is just basically stuff on the ground five is the weather and environment different types of stuff going on as far as rain wind sandstorm six is difficult to rain where now there's stuff on the ground and it's actually affecting your ability to move around seven moving parts this this one can get real spicy. We have carts and machine like horse buggy carriages swirling around. Maybe you're fighting in the in just outside the castle. Maybe there's a combat in the city streets and there's carriages actually running all over the place. And that's a layer action in some way where people have to dodge a section of traffic. And eight is to put actual creatures, neutral creatures or hostile or friendly, whatever. Just put creatures and people, different things that maybe aren't involved in the combat in the combat. And we're going to come back around to these neutral creatures in one of the later tips here because you can actually use those in the combat to make it even spicier. Time out before we get into tips two, three, and four. This PDF is a build a battle system that is available right now to my patrons of the Young Dragon and Above Love. Patreon is the number one way to support what I do here and me and the team and all the resources that we create to make even more and even bigger and better stuff. The support on Patreon goes a long way and patrons also get the DC playbook issued every single month with a ton of universal resources to use in your games right now. This build a battle system is only available during January and then you can find it linked down in the description on my website along with a ton of other stuff you can pick up individually from there all right now back to the tips the second tip for building better combat encounters in D&D this one's my favorite creatures and that's right not just creatures but dynamic creatures now I do actually have a whole system on dynamic creatures we have a lot of systems here that I also put the link down in the description but what I mean here is not just having five zombies I don't think I've ever ran an actual combat encounter with all of just the same mob that's just repeat copies of the same thing and if you've done that before that's fine this is what we're trying to hear to help kind of shake things up instead of having five zombies have one alpha zombie and four normal zombies at least that's a little better or maybe now there's one alpha zombie and one ogre zombie that's really slow and really massive and maybe that fifth zombie is really slow and it's like bulging and pulsing and about to explode and already with just a few seconds of thought we've taken five zombies and turned it into an actual encounter where one's about to explode one's huge and one's really scary so sure it's okay for two of those zombies to be very normal just stat sticks that don't have much going on even though I, I usually even have those have some sort of aura around them maybe or something else going on and it's really easy to just tweak homebrew these things up a little bit add an extra dice of damage add 10 more health 
add 50% more health, double its health. Or what I personally like to do is add extra abilities or extra attacks or extra cool things that happens when this thing's turn happens. Or a signature move that I like to do is give one of these creatures one legendary action. You don't have to always go to three. Just give it one legendary action and the alpha zombie now has a legendary action. Watch out. And I just thought of this while I'm talking to you guys here, but this explosive zombie actually was something that accidentally happened in the game. When you have creatures, this little bonus tip here is don't be afraid to run with them or have them do things that did you never planned beforehand. Because this happened, I described some sort of zombie type creatures and I described one of them being a little bit larger and like pulsing. One of the players said at the table, I think the thing looks like it's about to explode. In my head, I never thought of that, but that is a brilliant and amazing idea. So yep, now it's about to explode. The following round, I described it growing a little bit more and they freaked out a little bit more and then the next round it exploded. But another huge thing I like to do with these creature concepts is have interesting mechanics, have them have a puzzle almost to figure out how these things work and have that puzzle's solution be intertwined between a bunch of the different monsters possibly or objects in the area. Great example from a past game of this would be my players were on a boat and they got attacked by these fish people. But the interesting part is two of these fish monsters, one of them was completely blind. They basically had a mega disadvantage on all of their attacks. They couldn't do anything and they were just aimlessly wandering around until the other fish person monster that had some sort of, it was this large fatter creature with this, this like vomit attack, a little gross, sorry. But if any player got hit by this vomit attack, I described them being covered with this like muck and slime. As soon as that happened, this blind monster, looked over at them and could now see them. In my DM notes, I called this slime vision and this thing was only able to see things covered in the slime and ichor from his friends. Or if they were underwater, because at one point the players fell into a water and they all their heads spanned to them. Just that mechanic alone added so much interesting dynamics to the fight of these combos, this combo that enemies were gonna, it was fun for me to play this combo, trying to spin on, and then they had to decide, I have this slime on me now, do I spend part of my action economy to remove the slime off me so that thing can't see me, or do I just let it go. Players started to do interesting things about saying that they wanted to take their reaction to like raise their shield and block some of the slime. Oh, look at them interacting with the combat in interesting ways. Basically, the big tip here is think about all the different archetypes of these different bad guys. You could have bruisers, you could have big tank creatures, you have small spell casters, assassins, up close melee combatants, far away ranged combatants, spell casters and marshals, all mix it up. So maybe back to that zombie group, if you want to add in a spell caster, maybe you don't want to have a zombie spell caster because then that's too lit vibes for you. Maybe one of those zombies just has an aura around them that's mirroring some sort of spell. You could easily reflavor spells and it'd be some sort of natural creature components of a breath attack or some sort of necrotic plague. The third tip now for better D&D combat encounters are objectives, specifically alternate objectives or maybe even dynamic objectives that are different from just y'all kill them before they kill y'all. Because maybe the objective in a combat encounter is to not have any combat in that encounter and freaking run away from a big scary monster. Monster. Some of the most memorable fights had nothing to do with just killing the man to me before they kill you. That's so simple. Now, I'm not saying you can't have that be one of the elements. You can have alternate or multiple different objectives going on here. Your group walks up and they see five gnolls. Think about how engaging that fight would be if it's just those gnolls versus the players. Even if you spice it up and have an alpha gnoll and a gnoll that's about to explode or something. <laughs> Instead, what if one of those gnolls is holding somebody off the edge of a cliff or holding an NPC that they're going after over some flames? Maybe there's two NPCs that are held captive at two opposite ends of two different hallways and the players have to make some choices. Or maybe the gnolls also pissed off a group of angry goblins that are also arriving at the same time. So now your objective in this fight might not need to kill anyone. You could just navigate through the gnolls and goblins, get the two people you're trying to save and get the heck out of there. That combat I just randomly came up with now sounds really fun. And this is the mindset you need to be in is yes, I know that you're telling a story as a dungeon master. There's a campaign going on. There's a one shot going on. There's things going on, but you could, doesn't have to just be, we need to go here and get the gem. What if the gem is trapped inside of something that can only be broken by the breath of a dragon. So now the alternate win condition is to get the dragon oriented in some way so that it breathes on this thing to break and release it, then you can get it. And that'd be real bad if you weren't able to do that. And if you killed the dragon before it was able to do that, or the dragon became aware you were trying to do this, oh, you see the layers here? All right, I'm gonna share another part of the resource from the build a battle system. This is on page 23 is alternate objectives. You can have this 
key at the beginning and then a noun at the end to see kind of what combination of this alternate objective you can get. You could stop, save, protect, destroy, or retrieve a creature or person or an NPC that they're looking for, whether it be an ally or an enemy, objects, dangerous threats, environmental disasters. Maybe your entire objective is to stop someone else from completing their objective. Ritual, gateway, magic item, all that. But now what if these objectives aren't met? What if all of these alternate options of what the players could do don't end up panning out? What if they fail at getting that dragon to breathe on that container to break it to get that crystal? So the fourth tip for making better D&D combat encounters are ramifications. These are the stakes of the combat. Why is this thing happening? What are the stakes? It shouldn't always be the players dying. It could be someone else dying. It could be not being able to get that crystal out of the thing. What happens in the aftermath? What are the twists and turns? These things don't have to make the combat more intense or hard and this NPCs about to die it could be what happens after they win they save the city what happens now what complications did they mess up now or what benefits do they now gain because both of those can be true it doesn't always have to be a negative spin and i'll also say maybe they know these ramifications before or not maybe they know if we don't get this dragon to breathe on this container to get this crystal maybe they have to join up with some evil force and they're the only ones that can do it and they have to make a bargain or a pact with some sort of evil devilish fiery fiend and they can break into it but now they have another problem on their hands that's actually a great tool as a dungeon master to either let them know so you really raise the bar and set the stakes high because they know what's at stake or you keep that hidden and have a big surprise reveal. I had a huge heist on a big three plus year campaign where they had to finally escape. They, they did it. That's the combat encounter was escaping from this thing. A whole bunch of stuff went involved with that. But the ramification twist at the end, they leave, they escape, they get out of the walls of the place they were breaking into, and then whoosh, two different NPCs show up, and then a third. These three NPCs represented the three different factions in this city that they had all been pulling the strings, going back and forth, trying to make double deals, and in this big final moment of escaping, they had to choose who to go with. Each of the three offered three different means of escape, one in a carriage, one flying spells to be able to get away with. What are the players going to go do? This had nothing. They already beat the combat. The combat's good. But this is that twist ramification cherry on top of what are you going to do now? So on the fly, in the middle of everything, they had to choose really quickly. And I also did put a timer on this. I flipped over a 60 second timer, put it on the table. And and they, my players just know at that point, something bad is going to happen if that timer runs out. They had to choose which way to go. And they could only think of what ramifications were going to come based on those different choices because they were kind of going back and forth between the three of them. So if you take a big step back and you look at all of this. You have a dynamic setting and a terrain for this encounter to happen in. You fill it with really interesting and dynamic creatures full of different abilities that are, they have been able to interact with and combos and like puzzles almost to solve. You insert different objectives on top, like even just now. There's so many different levels to this. Objectives that they have to think about and try and move, and it's gonna be different than just kill them before they kill us. And then maybe there's either a looming over or an unknown mystery of a ramification that's about to happen, depending on how they do. And it's all the player's actions and choices which lead to these really interesting results. And then seeing that their actions lead to things, that's gonna also further increase the engagement. And overall, don't think like you have to do all four of these pillars. You could really choose to ignore the creatures thing. Maybe that's all you need. Maybe you just really have a really cool terrain. You have some really cool objectives and the they're, they are just five knolls. There's that's super simple. Maybe there's five knolls and it's not about that. It's not about having a bigger knoll and a smaller knoll and a ranged archer assassin, whatever. It, ignore that and just have a really cool two different bridges and there's rickety bridges and there's a split decision and the objective is they have to save the NPC. Maybe that's enough going on because you focused on the terrain and the objectives and this twist of who are we going to save and the thing we talked about about the knolls versus goblins. Maybe they are just really basic knolls and goblins and you ignore that creature pillar and just focus on on the other stuff or maybe ignore the objective pillar and then you have a really dynamic terrain with really interesting creatures that are very difficult and there's some high stakes here because everything's been big, building up to this a hard fight with complicated creatures and interesting mechanics oh that's exciting so don't feel like you have to really really bog things down with overdoing it too much i'm just trying to share all of these with you so that you can take something from them to spice up whatever it is that you were going to do that's why i make videos like this to help get your mind going and get those creative juices flowing that you got inside of you to be able to help take your combat encounters to the next level and then go further than that and make resources on the website on patreon every single month all that kind of stuff across the board to help really lay it out for you and do a lot of the legwork and muscle work for you to have to just have a resource in front of you get your tables get your mind going and so that you can lower that prep time and increase your fun time all that kind of stuff huge thank you to the patrons that support what i do here to be able to even be at this spot to be able to make these resources and these videos appreciate all of you guys and we just had our first D, &D one shot with patrons every single month 
month. I draw patrons' names and we play a one shot together. We did our first one and it was super fun, super exciting to be able to see you guys, play with you guys, and play some D&D together. So if any of that stuff sounds cool, all that stuff's always linked down in the description. Until next time, stay creative, think outside the box. Peace.